I will turn it over to Ben. Thanks, Carrie. Hi, all. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, this thing called Winning the Service Game. It's actually a book that I did with my colleague Dave Bowen a number of years ago. That was the title of the book. In any case, the agenda for today is uh, to talk a little bit about the benefits of uh, an emphasis on service quality in organizations. Um, to expand on uh, a definition of what service really is. So if you're going to do service quality, it might be good to know what service is. Um, it, it has some interesting, very interesting attributes. And, and when they're paid attention to, uh, as you'll see as the uh, webinar unfolds, then uh, organizations can do it well, service, and that yields uh, considerable improvements in customer satisfaction. So when we talk about customers, it's, it's also interesting to think about, well, what are their expectations for service quality? And, and service quality has a number of attributes, and I'll, and I'll discuss those as well. One of the main fo focuses of uh, the webinar is this issue of service climate. You might call it service culture. When I first began the work, um, we use the term climate and I've kept up with it. But uh, I'll talk about what service climate is and, and the evidence we have for service climate as a precursor and for sure as a correlate of customer satisfaction. Um, and last, I'll, I'll talk about what I call the uh, Thomas's English Muffin model of uh, climate or culture, and that is that it exists in all the nooks and crannies of organizations, and I'll talk about what some of those nooks and crannies may be as the webinar unfolds. We'll have some time at the end for uh, questions and answers. If, as I proceed, you have a question, you know, uh, just do what Carrie said and uh, let us know that you have that question and I'll try and respond to it as, as this goes. Okay, Carrie. So why are we interested in service quality? So let me proceed this, this discussion by indicating that uh, the work that I do on service quality and uh, service climate is, a, is an interesting combination of marketing and HR or, or organizational behavior and human resources management. So I've been quite active in the American Marketing Association as well as in uh, IO Psychology and, and the Academy of Management. So this combination is really cool because what we do is we look at service quality and its outcomes and then we're going to try and create service quality in organizations. So the marketing people have done a lot of work on, on the importance of service quality and here are a couple of the, the things that they've found. Um, when service quality is high in organizations, there are fewer errors made by the people who deliver service quality so there's less recovery and re rework required. So, so emphasizing service quality has this very positive consequence of increasing reliability and decreasing errors. It turns out that when, when organizations focus on service quality, customers feel like it's easier to deal with the organization. So they report that they don't have to work as hard, that they know what's going to happen and they're comfortable and they get reliable service and so forth. So this idea of a burden on the customer is reduced through service quality. It turns out that there's good research to show that a focus on service quality decreases the need to compete on price, of course within reason. But banks can offer a slightly lower interest rate Companies can charge a little bit more for, for what they, they deliver, even if it may be a product. If it's a heavy service focus with the product that's delivered, then this emphasis on service quality yields some negotiation room, let's say, on the issue of price. It turns out that it's also less expensive to sell an existing customer to update them to uh, upgrade them and so forth, then to try and attract a new customer. So there's, there's the less expense in especially marketing if you have a 
satisfied customer due to your service quality. It's easier to, to work with them as, as you move to the future. And of course, that results in this imp improved customer loyalty and revenues. Um, at the American Customer Satisfaction Institute, the ACSI, uh, out of the University of Michigan, and I'll talk about that later, the ACSI, they've shown that there's increased market value, cash flow, and return on investment for companies that have high customer satisfaction, which we, uh, we will show in this presentation, and it has been shown in various meta-analyses now, is a function of the kind of service climate that's created in organizations. And then there's this very interesting last bullet here. It, it looks like service quality yields an improved corporate reputation in the community where the company operates. So there's something called the Harris Reputation Quotient. It turns out that, that companies that deliver higher service quality score more positively on that reputation quotient. So the rule that, I, that I've come up with, and I'll have several rules as we go through this, is that service quality is not free, but it does pay. Okay, Carrie. So what is this thing called service? I talk about uh, the three faces of service. The first one, and the one that I think is the most important, is its relative intangibility. So service quality on the extreme, that is a highly intangible, it is all concerns acts and processes rather than possessions or, or goods. So it's, it's really difficult on the extreme um, service end to tangibly assess value because it's what customers experience that's important. So the total situation becomes critical from entry to exit. And I'll come back to that later because I'll talk about the importance of tangibles as part of the service quality issue. And, and the metaphor that I've found useful in thinking about service on the high intangible end is to think about service as symphony or theater. So, so the, the issue is that if it's acts and processes, it's what employees do vis-a-vis -vis customers that constitute the service. I mean, some people have even argued that every employee in a high service organ, in a high intangible service organization really represents that company so far as the customer is concerned. And that's, that's what's true in service, in symphony or theater. So when you go to the symphony, you don't take anything away but the experience. And the experience is made up of the coordination of many actors playing their part or playing their role, if you think about theater. So the rule that I've come up with here for, for companies and organizations who want to do service quality well is to think about the roles or parts for you and your staff and the way those roles or parts need to be coordinated impeccably in order to, live, to deliver service quality to customers. Okay, what's the second phase there, Carrie? So the second phase is what I call this customer participation in production. So in contrast to the production of goods, the production of services, especially on the high intangible side, requires customers to do things as well as uh, the employees to do things. So we started to talk about uh, customers as partial employees or co-producers. And there's a, there's a big literature now in the services marketing and services management um, arena that talks about co-production and the importance of it vis-a-vis -vis the way customers experience the service they receive. Now the problem is that customers don't have the same kinds of fears or commitment to the organization and their job as do employees. So the management, so to speak, of customers can become difficult and challenging in organizations because it's hard to buffer production from the customer 
since the customer is actually participating as a producer. So co-production is, is difficult to do, and for the employees who are trying to co-produce service delivery to customers, it can produce stress for them. So the research on role ambiguity and role stress for employees and service organizations is quite important and quite interesting because it reveals that the more co-production is required as part of the act, the higher the levels of stress employees experience, but the more the emphasis on service quality in their organization, the lower that stress becomes. So the desire to meet customers' expectations and needs is usually there for employees. They want to do a good job. Employees don't, don't want to do a poor job. But because of customer variability, it's difficult to adjust to each customer as they come to them, and they need all the support they can get in order to do it well. Um, one thing we've started to talk about a little bit is the fact that sometimes you may have to train customers in order to be able to have them be effective co-producers. So not many companies think about the necessity to train customers and, and the necessity for customers have, to have the ability they require in order to participate. But I think it's a really interesting idea and, and companies need to think more about that um, in the way of helping customers be effective co-producers. Okay, Kerry. So the third phase of service is this simultaneous production and consumption. I talk about it as simultaneity. So think about the fact that when you go and buy a television, for example, you know, when you go and buy a product, it's been made at one point in time and it's uh, stored and shipped and so forth and delivered at another point in time. Many services, especially on the high intangible side, and I keep talking about that, many services are produced and delivered simultaneously. There's no intervening time lag, something between the time the uh, customer comes to receive the service and the time the employee delivers it. So services frequently can't be inventoried. So you can't store them up, you can't freeze them, you know, for delivery at another time. There's less chance to do quality control because of the simultaneity. You know, once the service act un begins, it kind of unfolds and goes through. So there's less chance to do quality control from start to finish. It's also difficult to balance supply and demand because you need to be there when the customer is there. And, and balancing that supply and demand creates issues regarding staffing levels and capacity needs, and those are always difficult to judge. I mean, one of the most amazing things is, you know, when I was younger and you went to the bank on Friday night, you'd sometimes have to stand in line for a half hour. Well, of course, the ATM has achieved capacity need control which is one of the things that the banks wanted. So with regard to this delivery thing and this simultaneity, we've come up with this term seamlessness. C customers don't want to be herky-jerked through a delivery process. That's why customers hate to be put on hold and transferred from one um, person in the, in the call center to another person the, what they want to have is a seamless service experience because that's what simultaneity implies. So I have two rules here. One is to you, you, use yield management for capacity and pricing. So, so your operations people, that's their job. And the second rule, and it's one I'll come back to, is that because of this simultaneity, you need to create this service climate where employees who are delivering service to customers will attempt to do this seamless delivery when they have the resources necessary and so forth. Okay, uh, if you have questions about these three faces, 
um, of service, let me know. Okay, so um, let me just briefly mention a few companies that are renowned for their service quality and their service excellence. And, and you'll see that uh, IBM, you know, they've been through numerous transitions in their history, most recently moving from a product organization to a service organization, and they did that very effectively, I think, for the most part. And one of the things they did is they trained 30,000 of their managers to become, to understand what service is and how to help their employees be more service oriented if they're their product focus for so many years. Hyatt Hotels, they're, they're pretty um, highly recognized for the service quality they deliver and they think about the service quality they deliver as through their employees and their employees Behavior is based on guest feedback, various guest feedback mechanisms. The Ritz Carlton Hotel reduces service variability through their human resources systems. And one of the things that Ritz Carlton has done is it has given employees authorization to spend, in some cases, up to $1,000 to make customers right who have experienced some kind of problem in the hotel. Of course, American Express, um, they, they sort of invented, in some ways, the call center, and um, they have promoted call center service quality through a human resources approach. And I'll talk a little bit about call centers uh, later and some data we have on them. Um, perhaps, um, Carrie, if you go to the next slide, one of the best examples of a service quality emphasis and its effectiveness concerns the Mayo Clinic. And here are some of their goals in their service delivery. So as you can see, it's a comprehensive portrait of what they are trying to achieve vis-a-vis -vis their patients, customers, with regard to you know, relieving of stress, offering a place of refuge. Well, you can read this faster than I can. But the whole idea is to convey through behavior, caring, respect, demonstrating competence, and so forth. And one of the most interesting things is that they understand that service delivery to their patients is not a, only a one-on-one -on -one thing but it involves the families of the patients as well. So they, they really do have this comprehensive picture. There's a number of books on the Mayo Clinic, and if, you, if, you've, if you're really interested in this service quality thing, I think the books are really good, especially a book by uh, a guy named Len Berry on the Mayo Clinic. So you could find that interesting. Okay, next, Carrie. So what do customers expect? Well, this comes straight out of the services marketing literature. Um, there was some research back in the late early 80s, late 80s and early 90s on customer expectations for quality. And they came, after much research, they came up with these five facets of service quality. And you can see it abbreviates out as rater reliability, assurance, tangibles, empathy, and responsiveness. So I've already mentioned reliability, right? Delivering the required performance dependably and accurately. This assurance thing is the ability of the employee to inspire trust and confidence in the organization by the way they deliver service because of their knowledge and their courtesy. The tangibles, and I'll talk more about that since sometimes we overlook them in this intangible world, is the appearance of the facilities and equipment and so forth. I did one project a number of years ago in banks, and I showed that customer satisfaction was highly correlated with the extent to which customers thought that the equipment and machinery used to serve them was up to date. So 
So these tangibles do have an impact on service quality. And I'll, again, I, as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. This empathy issue is really a very difficult one to study, but we now have some good evidence to show that A, there are individual differences in the extent to which people are empathetic, and people who go into service work tend to be more empathetic than other people. And, and it's this, this ability to show personalized sensitivity to a particular customer's needs and desires. So rather than having a general rule that you treat all customers this way, that way, the other, that you allow some flexibility on the part of employees to demonstrate that they are aware of and understand a particular customer's needs and desires. And finally, the issue of responsiveness. The customers don't want to wait. That's this waiting time in organizations. I mean, I did some research early on on waiting time, and uh, I, I would have people who were waiting in line, and I'd interview them and ask them, well, how long did you wait in line, you know, when they finally got to the front of the line? And on average, people overestimate by three, by three times how long they waited in line. So if they wait two minutes, they say they waited six minutes and so forth. So, so waiting time is a difficult issue, and of course, that's why this thing called the S-line was invented, because people feel they are continuing to move. And when people continue to move, then they are less likely to feel that they've been waiting a long time without anything happening. Any questions about these uh, customer expectations for quality? All right, let's proceed, Carrie. I keep telling you that it's, it's easy to ignore these tangibles and that I was gonna come back and emphasize it. So he, here's, I'll give you the rule first. The rule is that the more intangible the offering that you're delivering to customers, the more the tangibles matter. And the reason for that is, as I said earlier, it's, it's hard for customers to have something to hold on to when they're involved in a highly intangible service like going to the theater or going to a symphony. Now, when you go to the theater, right, what, do you, what happens when you enter the room, the auditorium? The auditorium is this beautiful red velvet, right, chairs and everything, you know, there's beautiful carpet, carpets, the, the, the curtain, in front of the stage is this unbelievably gorgeous thing, the lighting and everything. Now, why, why is that done that way? It's done that way because they're trying to set the right tone for the calming, intangible experience. Now, after, after this is over, if, you're, if you go out to your parking lot, I want you to look at your parking lot and see, see what it looks like. It, when was the last time it was resurfaced? What, what did the gardens and, and plantings look like? I, I have a supermarket here in the town where I live, and every time I go by it, I say to myself, now how could they let their gardens go like this? It's such a, it's such a terrible, you know, greeting to, to uh, customers. So entry, upkeep, and look. Um, the paint, you know, there's chip paint in places, carpets are torn, and you know, thank goodness for uh, what's that tape called, you know, uh, everybody puts it on everything, but you don't want to put it on the carpets where your customers are walking. Uh, sign, signage, I find signage in most service organizations to be impossible to understand if they exist at all. And then, as I said earlier, this equipment and machinery thing. So, again, the rule, the more intangible the offering, the more the tangibles matter because they set the tone for what's going to happen on the intangible side. Okay, Kerry. So the whole idea is to create some kind of positive emotional bank account with your customers. 
So, so you make various deposits in there. You can see, you know, seek first to understand, keep promises, be kind, clarify things, demonstrate, apologize. You know, um, do, do the kinds of things that, that reveal empathy and sensitivity to customer needs and desires. And, and, and don't do the kinds of things that are listed under withdrawals. You know, when a customer complains, don't tell them that they don't understand. You, you, I mean, that's, you can't do that. You can't break promises. You can't violate expectations. People who are, who are regular customers of your place, boy, you can't, you can't do things that are going to get them upset. You can't show pride and arrogance, and you have to be receptive to feedback. So the, the, the rule here is that a large emotional bank account serves to buffer the impact of errors. Service organizations make errors. Then they have to engage in something called recovery from those errors. And there's good research on recovery. A, it has to be immediate. And B, the better the relationship that you have with that customer where you have made the error, the, the, the stronger and more positive the emotional bank account that you've created with them, the more likely it is that the error will not have extreme impact on them, extreme negative impact on them. So, so this idea of building up this account serves to be able to compensate for errors that, that might get introduced as they will. There's no such thing as error-free service delivery and you need to be ready for it. And one way to get ready for the errors is to ensure the strongest emotional bank account that you can with each of your customers. One of the ways that we think this happens is through this service climate issue that I'm going to talk about um, next. So um, in the work that I've done with companies on service, I've run hundreds of focus groups with the employees who work in, in the companies. And I, I talk to them and I ask them, you know, well, um, when you talk with your friends and stuff, what do you say about, about the service organization you work in? Uh, what do you think the service climate or culture of this place is? And I focus on service, climate, or culture. So he, he, here are some quotes from an organization. This is from one organization that I determined had what I called a high passion for service, a positive passion for service. So if you read through these things, I mean, they're unbelievable. Service has been ingrained since we opened more than 130 years ago. That's all I've ever heard since I started working here. The older people here teach what customer is to the newcomers. So, so you get this transmission of the climate or culture from old timers to newcomers. No cutthroat atmosphere. So um, people are not competing with each other, but they're competing to give the best possible service. They share responsibilities and goals. People support one another. I'll come back to that support one another in a little bit because we have some interesting data on that too. Employees are not working for the money. Well, you can read these. So it's, it's uh, the bank in which we did these focus groups, most of their employees were former customers of the bank, and they got such good service that they applied for jobs, they felt they would want to work in a place like that. Well, let's compare a positive passion for service to the next one where we did uh, focus groups. This was a mortgage bank. Next slide, please. So this is the negative passion for service. People here think about pressure, space, and hostility, not about customer service. And I love the second bullet. Our typical approach to the customer is that he or she is guilty until proven innocent. 
Well, those of you who've gone to get a mortgage recently or probably ever, understand that one in your exchanges with the mortgage bank. Um, but before I began to be affiliated with the Center for Effective Organization, I, I worked for a large consulting firm and I tried to get them to accept a blog that I had written. The title of the blog was, Why Can't Getting a Mortgage Be As Easy As Getting Root Canal Surgery? So I had recently had root canal surgery and it was like this great experience. And, and within two weeks, I had tried to get a mortgage and it wasn't a great experience. Anyway, you can see, excessive and inflexible rules, oriented to the company and not the service, not the customer. People don't talk to each other, management's concerned with profits, not people or service. So you, you can, you get the tone, right, of the, of the difference in these two organizations. A, what it would be like to work there, B, what it would be like to go and get service there, and C, what it would be like to never have to go there again. All right, so I've tried to summarize these issues about passion for service with a measure I developed of this thing called climate for service, and we'll look at that next. So here are some items uh, from a survey I've developed about service climate. So again, you, you can read through these things we talk about. These are reports that employees make about what's happening to them and around them in their workplace. So the job knowledge and skills of employees in the business to deliver superior quality work and service. So we ask employees to rate the extent to which these attributes or these characteristics of the organization in which they work are excellent. You know, we talk about outstanding, excellent, very good, good, fair, or worse, right? So um, you, you can see in the second item, the efforts to measure and track the quality of work and service in the business. Recognition and rewards employees receive for service. Overall quality of service provided that, that we think we provide. The leadership shown by management in the business to support the service quality effort. So sometimes when people look at surveys like this, they say, all right, but you didn't measure this and you didn't measure that and you didn't measure the other thing. How come you measured these? Well, what we did is we took uh, more than 100 focus groups that we had run, and we illuminated the issues that seem to emerge most frequently as characterizing the service climate or culture of the organizations in which people worked. So when you develop a measure of a climate or culture, you don't have to measure everything, right? As I said earlier, I'll talk about this nooks and crannies model. What we try to do is get at a high variety of nooks and crannies that send the message that service quality is important in this organization. And so that's what we did with this measure. And the measure has been used in tens of studies now and meta-analyses show, and I'll give you some data that I've generated, that, that when service climate is high for the employees in a workplace, then customer satisfaction tends also to be high. And in addition, as I'll also show you, um, financial outcomes for those co companies or organizations also seem to be high. So let's look at, at some of what that might look like. So on the next slide we, we see, um, this was in the branches of a bank. You see that on on the, x-axis on the bottom line, those are employee reports on the service climate of the bank in which they work. And then on the y-axis to the left, the service quality customer views, you see the service quality reports of the customers of those branches. So we had about 300 employees working in 23 branches 
we had about 700 customers and we assign customers to the branch in which they receive service, right? And then we average those and for the employees, we assign them to the branch in which we, they work and we average those service climate data and then we plot them. And for those of you who are interested in correlation coefficients, this correlation is almost 0.7. So it's a quite substantial relationship across units between these service climate reports and the service quality customers say they receive. As I said earlier, there, there's a lot of research substantiating this same relationship, so it's, it's not unique. Now, sometimes when I, I present these kinds of data, people question, well, is this always true? Does service climate always lead to service quality? Aren't there some contingencies on this kind of thing? And I'll, t I'll talk, let me talk a little bit about what those contingencies are as I proceed through some additional projects that I've done. So, um, Terry, yeah. So we, we did a project in a, a chain of supermarkets uh, a couple of years ago. And here in, in these bar charts, the top 25%, the dark blue, is, indicates that the top 25% of service climate yielded satisfaction with people higher than the satisfaction with people shown in the bottom 25% of service climate. So if we split up all of the service climate data we got across these supermarkets, we took the top 25% on service climate and asked, what did the customers say about the satisfaction they experienced with the people who served them, with the product they received, with the place, you know, the tangibles, and the price they had to pay. And you can see that when service climate is high as reported by employees, the customers in those supermarkets report significantly superior satisfaction with the people, product, place, and price they experience. So let's go to the next one. Okay, these are credit card customer service representative teams. So I, uh, earlier I, met, I talked about um, these uh, call centers and, and here you have it again. So the, the outcome of interest here is the percent of the team at or above the goal that was set for them. Again, we take the teams in the top 25% on service climate and ask, are they superior to the teams in the bottom 25% on talk time, customer care, availability, and the average across those three? And you can see, again, these are significant differences across CSR teams based on the service quality that the employees in them report. So we're not asking employees what's your talk time, what's your customer care, but these are independently judged phenomena, so it's uncontaminated. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see it's a very interesting phenomenon as well. Oh, I guess it's not the next one. Okay, so um, I've talked about supermarkets and um, I've talked about those uh, CSR teams and we did a big project across companies. So uh, one of the outcomes of interest in this project was this American Customer Satisfaction Index that I talked about earlier the ACSI. Those of you who are interested and are not familiar with this, you can go to a website. It's called theacsi.org, theacsi.org. It's out of the University of Michigan and, and it's a, an amazing project that they've been running for years. So 
Um, here is some data on it. You know, a one point increase in annual ACSI is equal to 11.4% of ROI and so forth. In other words, it's a good thing to have a high uh, ACSI score. In addition to that, we had the market value of these companies. And we, we index market value in terms of Tobin's Q. It's a financial index that looks forward and it's based on the share price of the firm corrected for the replacement cost of assets. So um, as you all know, share price is a forward-looking issue and companies are really interested in it. But, but sometimes we look at it and don't correct it for the fact that, that um, there are differences in the assets required in order to produce the business. So on the present sample, Tobin's Q is correlated 62 with ROA. So it's a, it's a really good index. So let's look at what the data look like. So here's service climate collected in year one against year two, year one, year two, and year three on customer satisfaction by the ACSI. And you can see, once again, we take the high 25% on service climate and ask, what did the ACSI scores look like in those companies compared to the low? Now, one of the really nice things about this particular chart, that's why I'm showing it to you, of course, is that the data collected in year one predicts out to year two and year three. So not only does it correlate with ACSI performance in the year the data were collected, but it predicts out to year two and year three. And you'll see on the next slide that it does this also for Tobin's Q. So, so the service climate data looks like it's durable over time in what it's able to account for in the way of um, future customer satisfaction and in this case, in the present slide, uh, market value. Okay, Kerry, let's uh, go on. So here's what I thought was that previous slide. These are airlines on the American Customer Satisfaction Index. And you can see the service climate index, again, is at the bottom, that 3.0, 3.5, 4.0. And then there's the American Customer Satisfaction Index scores on, on the y-axis. And, and this correlation across only six airlines was statistically significant, likely because of the one in the upper right. And we can all take guesses as to what that airline might be. But you can see the power of this service climate data from employees to pick up what the customers are also picking up. Okay, next. So you can see the rule at the bottom of this thing. You know, we talk about building a, a positive foundation for service climate. And again, I talk about this nooks and crannies model. You can see that the, the super, supervisors and leaders have to do their jobs effectively, not just with regard to service, but to, to provide that foundation. But people, people in organizations will do the kinds of things that are strategically important for those organizations when they are treated well by the organization. In terms of supervision and leadership, you know, about their responsive to requests in my manager plans and set goals so forth, that they have the resources they need in order to do their jobs. For example, the systems we work with are easy to use, that, that people feel that they, they are participants in what happens. So in service organizations in particular, people are consulted about the design and implementation of new service delivery systems. I, I mean, we, we did one project where where the issue was whether or not employees felt that they were prepared for buying marketing for the introduction of new products and services. So
So mar marketing is always way out and ahead of where HR is and, and sometimes fails to consult with HR on the necessity to train people in, in the delivery of new products and services. So there used to be this song, right? House built on a weak foundation will not last for long. So that's the rule. If you don't have the foundation, you're not going to be able to do this service quality. Okay, next. Uh, one of these uh, foundations that we've discovered is this thing we call internal service. So we, we ask people in organizations to tell us about who in the organization did they depend on in order to deliver service quality, and then what is the quality of the service delivered by that unit in order to help them. So here's the rating scale we use. So we ask, with regard to the other area on which you most, de most depend to deliver service, how would you rate? And then you can see, you know, cooperative, ability to keep promises, the helpful attitude, and so forth. So the rule here is that the service customers receive is no better than the service received by those who deliver to customers. And, and so this internal service thing is a kind of a, I, I guess it's a kind of a sneaky, unsuspected um, issue with regard to customer satisfaction, but in our research it turns out to be quite important. Okay, next. So I keep talking about this, this nooks and crannies model and I'll summarize with it. I mean, the whole idea is that there are, there are hundreds of things that tell employees that service quality in your organization is important. So, so do we allocate resources to facilitate quality? Are promotions and rewards for service delivery excellence? So if, if we promote people who sell a lot but deliver bad service, that sends a message that selling is much more important than service. Do we get training on how to be responsive, helpful, empathetic, and so forth? And, and is the focus on quality of service delivery or speed? So, I mean, companies introduce things like, you know, the phone has to be answered in 30 seconds, but, but it, it doesn't talk about how it should be answered. And do we listen to employees? And then, you know, it's not just the HR that's responsible. So marketing is responsible, as I said. Does marketing introduce products and services without considering the necessity of the employees to deliver them? Does operations set up information technology for use by employees who deliver service quality that's based on operations standards rather than on usability by people? So the rule here is the service quality message resides in all the nooks and crannies of the organization. And the more of those you can identify, the more likely it is that you will deliver service quality on the one hand and that your customers will be satisfied on the other hand. Okay. So let's go to the Q&A. This is uh, kind of repeating some stuff I've already talked about, Kerry. So please ask some questions, make some comments. We'll be here for at least another 10 minutes. So if anybody has a question or comment, you can Click the hand to raise your hand to ask it, and I'll unmute your line, and you can uh, ask your question or make your comment, or you can just type it in the chat box and send it to, to everyone for us to see. We're going to give it another couple of minutes in case someone's typing in the chat box. Right, while we're waiting on that, let me uh, just provide two cautions in, in what, I, what I presented. So it could sound from what I said that service climate is always related to customer satisfaction. 
But it, it turns out that the meta analyses show that in general that's true, that this service climate is related to customer satisfaction. But there are some conditions on that. And, and we've, we've done some research on what those are. And what we've been able to show is that the more intangible the service being delivered, the more important service climate is for customer satisfaction. So that's the first one. The more intangible, the more important service climate is. The second thing is that, that the more it requires employees to cooperate, as in a team, or if you think about it, as in a symphony orchestra, the more service delivery requires interdependence in the way of delivering the service to the customer, the more important service climate is. And the third thing is that the more frequently customers visit a facility, the more important service climate is to customer satisfaction. So those are three, we, we talk about them as boundary conditions or three conditionals on this relationship. But across the, the tens of studies that have now been done on this, the relationship is significant and reliable and durable across many different kinds of settings with these slight variations due to intangibility, the requirement of interdependence, and the frequency of the customer visit. So we have a question in the chat box, um, and it is, technology is replacing more and more customer service people, for example, bank tellers and retail clerks. What does this mean for the future of customer service? Well, there's, there's increasing research on that question. It's a really good question. The more the technology is designed with people in mind, rather than designed by the technology people without people in mind, the higher the level of service quality customers experience. So, so the, the rules still follow, but the technology has to be a, reliable, B, consistent, designed with empathy, so, so people need to have options and choices when they want them. And so it's very difficult to design such information technology, as, as you all know when you go on the web and try and find something that you're looking for. All right, we have another question, and that is, what is your view of the service profit chain work and its conclusions about the relationship between customer service and profitability? Yeah, I mean, the service profit chain work is really amazing. Um, they actually have a new edition of the book out. Um, I think it's uh, 2012 or 2013. Um, for those of you who don't know what the service profit chain is, I mean, they literally argue and present evidence to support the idea that the more a company is focused on service quality delivery, the more likely it is that customers will be satisfied. You know, the same kind of arguments that I've been making here. They make a connection between employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction which I think may be a slight overgeneralization of the issue. That's why I focus on the service climate that employees report they have rather than on their satisfaction. But obviously the two of them are, are related. So it's, it's excellent work. It's out of Harvard uh, University. Um, and they were some of the earliest and most consistent um, producers of this kind of research, integrating the, the human organization stuff with the customer satisfaction stuff in the services management arena. So if you've not seen that work, I, I recommend it highly. I also recommend that book called Winning the Service Game, of course. 
we have another question in the chat box, and it's, although Ben makes a differentiation between culture and climate, many, many people conflate these two. Are there big advantages to focus on a climate issue like service or tackle the organizational culture? I would tackle the climate issue first because it's more, you know, I use this term tangible. It's more, it's more tangible. As you can see in the items on, on the service climate survey, it, it describes occurrences, events, activities, and so forth. If you go after the culture issue, you're talking about values, and they lie at a deeper psychological realm. I mean, even Ed Schein has now been talking about this relationship between climate and culture, that one way to achieve the kind of long-term value-oriented culture that he has discussed is by making things happen at the climate level. So it's not an either or, but it's easier to work on the climate thing than to work directly on the culture thing. And by working on the climate, more tangible kinds of events and practices, you may achieve that, those deep values that you're after with regard to the organizational culture. Great, thanks. So um, we don't have any more questions in the chat box right now. I might give it just a minute before we wrap up, just in case somebody's sending something through. Okay, I think it's safe to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Ben, for the great webinar and all the useful information. And thank you, everyone else, for attending. Uh, we hope you have a great day. Thanks, all.